KC's Audio Vault. Joel Plaskett, April 16th, 2012. Uh, one second if you're there, Casey. Hang on. Yep. Hey. How's it going today? Good. How you doing? I'm doing okay. We're still kind of uh, coming in and out of reception. Are we? Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's just we're sorry about this. We're just in the... Uh, in the Rocky Mountain foolishness. Are you on a pit stop yeah. right now? Uh, we're we're rolling, and hopefully we're we're kind of we're not closed in in the mountains. We're on one of these big highways, so it seems like we'll cross my fingers and hope that we uh, the reception holds for the conversation. So you are headed to Banff today. Yeah, that's right. Has it been a good day of driving? Has it been good views? Nice weather? Yeah, it's gorgeous. It's great. Yeah, we left Salmon Arm this morning, and now we're just rolling. It's great. You've gone back and forth across Canada many times. Do you get little flashbacks when you're in certain places from earlier experiences? Absolutely. I mean, there's, you know, it's like, stay there, look at that motel, you know, like there's all the kind of memories of other tours, stops and all that. I mean, it's just full of that because, you know, I've been, I think the first time I crossed the country was 94. So, and I've pretty much been out in some fashion almost every year since then, whether it's flying or driving, you know, here and there across the country more times than I think I could count. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of memories, man. <laughs> Do you have any specific Winnipeg remembrances? Uh, yeah, there's there's quite a few. I remember staying at the Royal Albert upstairs. Uh, um, you know, I got some friends in Winnipeg that I really will forever associate with that town and just walking those big windy streets, you know, and it's just some great shows. I mean, we've done a lot of different rooms there over the years. The Collective Cabaret, and there was the Royal Albert, and uh, the Garrick last time, and the Garrick again. We played there with the Hip. I'm pretty sure on that Hip tour at the big, the MTS Center, or whatever it's called. Right. Yeah, that's the one. I like Winnipeg a lot. So it's kind of a, it's got character, you know, and it's remote in the way uh, Halifax is remote in a different kind of way. So. I sort of relate to it. It's got to happen in art scene, too. One of the first bands that I, I got to see in a bar, you know, there's a lot of all-ages yeah. shows in Winnipeg, but at the Albert, it was it was Thrush Hermit for me, and like 18 years old, and whenever I hear those old songs, so you get kind of transported back, buying my own beer, or the cigarette smoke, or the scary guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Music triggering a memory, that seems to be the main topic of the new song, You're Mine. Am I on the right track there? Uh, you are, absolutely. I mean, it's about that kind of time travel that you have with music when you hear a song and it places you in a, another point in your life, like maybe when you first heard it or when you associate with it. And it's really visceral, or like not visceral, but it's a really visual thing, strangely, you know, like you're like there if you close your eyes. I uh, I like that. I, you know, I, that's the thing I love about music is how it really can take you somewhere. But, you know, the record, so there's that nostalgic element, but it's also about trying to create some new music to have a new set of memories attached to. Now, you released a song on iTunes once a week for, for Scrappy Happiness for 10 straight weeks. Was that was that comfortable? Did you feel like you were rushed? There was definitely some rushing. There were some weeks that were not as rushed, and I felt like, yeah, this is it. It, it, it was done, you know, a day or two before the deadline, pretty much, or it, was not, it, was, it wasn't hurried in the process. Because a week to record a song is a lot of time to spend on a piece of music. The only... But the, the challenge is, is if you don't sort of find your groove or, or the sound that you're chasing and time marches on and you have a deadline, it's like, it's, it's a little different than being able to kind of work on a record and then step away for a couple of days and come back with fresh ears. This was like, got to get it, got to get it. Um, there's stuff I change about it now, but I really wanted to stay true to the spirit of the project. So, um, but there was definitely some days where I was like, holy smokes, hustle to the finish line. Are there mistakes or just sort of something you would change? You know, there's some mistakes, but I, usually they're kind of happy accidents. I, I mean, I tend not to leave stuff that I'm like, you know, that I think is bad sounding. I, it's, it's more like there's some stuff where I'm like, well, uh, there's shaky little vocal moments or guitar solos that are certainly riddled with imperfections and rhythmic nuances that might shimmy one way or the other, but there's a point where you go, do I stand behind the tune and did I capture at least the, the spirit of the song? And, 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 you know, it's just trying to strike that balance really is, is, is for me the, the, the thing, but there's definitely, you know, there's mixed decisions. I change, you know, having 
a week or two away from a song, you could always remix it and maybe make it a little bit, change the nature of the impact in whatever way. But uh, again, like, uh, I, there's a lot of records that I like that really sound kind of weird. <laughs> and that's what becomes part of the character, you know? That's why I love how Scrooge so much. Is there's all this blurry mystery to it. I don't think they had time. Like, a lot of, a lot of great records were made without a ton of time to toil over the mixes. So with that in mind, I tried to kind of keep that spirit. You know. How much was figured out before this 10 week process? Well, I had a sense of, um, which songs were going to be recording. Like there was, I probably had, you know, 15 to 20 songs, but I had sort of the 10 that I had in my mind were the ones that I had marked for, for, for with the guys with the band, you know, and, and I just thought, um, I, but I, I didn't know what order we'd record them in. I kind of figured that out as we went along. I sort of tried to, and then the sequence of the record is different than the, the sequence in which we recorded them. Cause it really just based on sort of a week to week thing. Like it was one week where Chris was away and then, you know, there was just different things came into play where we had commitments of one nature or another. And so it was like, today we do, and this week's going to be an acoustic song. I need a break or whatever. So, you know, I tried to think about it, but I was trying to kind of curate the songs in a way that was, there was like a lyrical theme throughout the record that would hopefully unite it a little bit because I knew that on a production level, it would be a little bit different every week because we weren't doing all the drums at once. So there wasn't going to be that sort of consistent sound uh, as much. Although I do think it, I think, you know, there's still a lot of stuff that holds together on a sonic level, but there's definitely some variety. Uh, there's one lyric on the new album that I didn't catch at, at first listen, but a friend says that you, you name drop Cactus. Yes. The Mighty Cactus. In Bogart's band, yeah. He was thinking that maybe you were writing these songs a, a week at a time and then you felt extremely happy that you were able to rhyme Cactus with practice. <laughs> well, it was funny. I had a, I, I had a really forced rhyme that I, I cut from that verse where I was trying to rhyme uh, car, like it said, uh, you know, uh, what was it? I forget what I say, but I had car, like there's these double rhymes at the top of it. It's like, you know, getting warm, getting warmer. I had a rhyme that was like Carmen App, Carmen Apis, but it's not Apis, it's Apice, you know? <laughs> Carmen, I was listening to Cactus, I thought, oh, that's just too much. I've, I've gone I've, I've gone down like a nerd vortex, so I I changed it to something else. <laughs> do, you, do you put in little, uh, like, like nerd bits and it's kind of fun to see fans catch them? Well, yeah, I mean, I like referencing stuff and I just like having fun with, with lyrics, you know, I want to kind of, and a lot of it is just like, write it and go, you know, and I revisit it sometimes at the last minute and change little things. I kind of want to make sure the meaning is, is still tight, you know what I mean? Um, but I like it if, it's, if it rambles a little bit, and gives people and other like music fans sort of touchstones to listen to and go, oh yeah, you know, like little nods to other songs and stuff. So do you have notepads and tapes with, with all your ideas and when it's time to make an album, you kind of dig through? There's definitely some notepads, but actually there's a lot of like voice memos on my uh, iPhone. That's kind of where I document a lot of it because, you know, it travels with me and it's easy and it's kind of replaced the tape dictaphone, which I used to use. And it kind of catalogs them all and I can go, oh yeah, well, and then go back and sort of actually, it's kind of neat because it dates things. I can hear the month. You can see the month or the day when an idea got sparked and then I kind of listen to those while I'm traveling in my downtime and go back and fish through ideas that might have not been fleshed out. And that, and then sometimes when we're just rolling down the road, I just write more words or uh, the songs just kind of a cappella in my head once I have sort of a framework or a little, little kernel of an idea and then just kind of go from there. So you, you kind of sing to yourself on your voicemail. Uh, not on my voicemail, just in like voice memos, you know, like there's that kind of thing on the iPhone. All right. Where you can actually, you can actually just record a voice memo. Um, so it's essentially a dictaphone. Uh, and I just sing a cappella. I mean, a lot of the ideas come just kind of as like little rhymed. Meter is a really big thing for me. Like once I have a meter and I can feel like a central beat and a, meet, uh, a lyrical bounce off a rhythm. And, you know, there's always there's chords that play and stuff, melodies, but... Part of it is like a meter that works with a melody. Once I have that, that's when the song starts coming together. Because if it's too, if, it, if, if the rhythmic nuance of it is wishy-washy on a lyrical meter, then it doesn't, it, I, I find it hard to form the idea. You know? 
Are you a bit of a pack rat? Uh, yeah, I got a lot of stuff. You know, like stuff just piles up. Every once in a while, I try and call, but you know, I'm definitely like I'm hauling a bunch of guitars around because I've got all these different tunings that I write things in, so it makes things like just complicates <laughs> my life, you know. But it makes it it's just more. In, yeah, I try, you know, I try to follow my nose, and sometimes it leads me to just stuff. I have these like monkeys that I got hardwired for the tour, these rock and roll monkeys from the 60s that were battery operated. They play guitar. They're just tiny little toys. Got them on top of my amp for the tour. So yeah, I guess I'm a pack rat. And what's your house like? Is it well organized? You just got stacks of books and records? Yeah. Now my, wa- my wife keeps me in check. Got lots of records, lots of books, but they're all in one place for the most part. It's just the, uh, the band gear sometimes has, you know, the guitar pedals and stuff has to find another home. I have to, I've had to separate house and uh, work a little bit. So I have a studio now, which it can be as messy as I want. <laughs> she hasn't forced you to have a garage sale or anything? No, you know, she's a bit of a collector herself. She's got lots of old vintage clothes and fabrics and stuff. She's a real kind of photographs. She's an artist, so visual things make sense. But every once in a while, we take stock, step back and go, all right, what can we part with here? Because... You know, it's just easy to, we're, we're kind of going to like Value Village, just this and that, just picking up weird stuff as we go along. Uh, it, it's fun, but there is a point where you have to draw the line. Today, I, I spent way too much time watching a bunch of your videos and interviews on uh, YouTube. The uh, emergency was on Strombo show a couple of weeks back. They had a, a little short bio yeah. at the start. It says, uh, hailing from the East Coast, Plaskett has been a prominent figure in the Canadian indie rock scene for the past 20 years. That made me feel kind of old. How about you? You know, there's only one way to go but up, man. <laughs> Until you stop going there. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I, it puts it in perspective a little bit. It has been a lot. I mean, I've, I'll actually be 37 by the time we hit Winnipeg. I, um, I'm turning uh, 37 on, in Calgary. But uh, so I've been on tour almost... 20 years like 18 we basically hit the road right out of high school so it's uh definitely adding up but uh, i still enjoy it i mean that's i wouldn't be doing it if i didn't like it you know i mean i'm that's partly why i've got the studio back home too is so i can do some work a little closer to home and i'm getting into producing stuff for other people now and then and trying to kind of make it so that the road isn't the only option if you know what i'm saying although it's always going to be part of my life because i like gigging there's just kind of a challenge and a fatigue and a, and a, and you know, just a, you don't want it to turn into a grind. So I try and do other things and then take it on the road when it really makes sense. And everybody's excited. Another uh, YouTube clip. It was a much music thrush hermit interview from 1997. You said you, you found it more difficult to translate happy emotions into lyrics, but you kind of hoped someday you, you could, do you, do you think you've grown into the, the songwriter that you wanted to be? Well, it's, yeah, I mean, I definitely, my perspective has changed. Uh, I don't find that as difficult. I think this record in particular, there's there's some melancholy or sort of bittersweet sentiments on it, but I also think that there's a lot of joy on it in terms of, you know, and I like to have fun with words. So I, I guess maybe the answer is yes. I don't know. I think I've still got a, long, a lot of ways to go. And I, I mean, there's, I, you know, I enjoy writing. And so I tend to um, look at it now and then and try and be not objective, but go, well, well, this is what I was doing at this time or whatever, you know, but a part of my like perspective on it is framed by how other people have filtered it. So, you know, you read what other people write about records and you go, Oh, this is what I was doing. <laughs> or whatever, you know, like, whereas, you know, there's still a lot of kinds of songs I wish I could write and I can't, you know, Um, but I'll get there, you know, or I'll I'll try and fail, or it'll just turn into some weird mashup, which is usually more interesting anyway than just trying to strictly imitate an idea. So, uh, you know, I just, I'm a believer that for me, as much as I'd like to kind of, editing is important and trying to be selective is good. I tend to just write a lot and throw stuff at a wall, see what sticks and put a lot of stuff out there because just really never know what's going to connect with people. And if I feel good about it, then I just kind of do it and move on. Any plans for your birthday in Calgary on Wednesday? 
Uh, I'm going to see my brother-in-law there and uh, hopefully his kids, my niece and nephew, and um, I think just uh, enjoy the show. And, you know, I seem to always be away from home on my birthday. We always tour in April. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's always hockey playoffs time, too, so there's always this kind of like Dave who plays drums in the emergency big hockey fan, so there's always a little bit of like, we got to get close to the game, you know, like, <laughs> what time are we playing at? You know, that kind of thing. There's always that nervousness that you're going to lose some of your audience if you're in, like we were in Vancouver the other night when the Canucks were playing. I was like, oh, shit, here we go. But if we had a great show, it was sold out. Well, Joel, have yourself a really good birthday. We're uh, looking forward to seeing the Joel Plaskin emergency at the Garrick on Saturday night. We're going to see you there. Thanks, Casey. Appreciate it, man. Nice talking to you. 991FreshFM.com. Fresh FM.com.